Hello everyone and welcome. This is Matt from InDefensive Plants and today we're combining two of my favorite things, parasites and orchids. The orchid we're looking for is small, easily missed, and not known by a lot of people. So I think it's a good time to showcase this plant and a beautiful time to be out in the forest. So come on, let's go find it. Late August, early September are perfect times to go searching for warm season grasses like Indian grass here. And they're a really refreshing break because instead of growing mostly in the late spring, early summer like most plants are, these guys really hit their stride in late summer, early fall when things are way hotter. Everything about this plant is adapted to being able to grow in these warm, dry conditions. Now these are what we call a C4 grass. In other words, they take in CO2 by opening their stomata during the coolest parts of the day, early morning, late afternoon. And then during the heat of the afternoon, they close up those stomata because the CO2 was stored as an acid. And then that acid can then release CO2 molecule, molecules deep within the leaf, which is, allows them to photosynthesize with their stomata closed. That way they're able to conserve water. And a lot of people fail to realize that grasses truly are flowering plants. And this Indian grass here is in full bloom right now. Check out these beautiful anthers dangling in the wind waiting for a breeze to take away their pollen and deposit them somewhere else on a female. It is a great species for a warm season grass meadow and one you should definitely incorporate on your landscape. We haven't got a lot of rain lately, so in looking for the orchid, I'm trying to find places that have kind of a higher water table, which led us to this little marsh area right here. Now I know we're not looking for marsh vegetation, but anytime I see a habitat like this, I have to stop and take a look, because there's always going to be cool things in here. Kind of like this arrowweed, arrow leaf right here, Sagittaria. We've even got a little bit of frog bit right along the edges here. Reminds me a lot of a lantana, and tends to hang around in wetter soils. One of the coolest plants I've been seeing is this little skull cap here. It's a member of the mint family in the genus Scutellaria, and despite its size, it's got these really small but beautiful flowers worth taking a hand lens to. But one of the all-time rock stars of these marshy habitats is right here. The jewel weeds. It's in the genus Impatiens, and it is a beautiful plant that hangs out wherever the soils remain a little bit wet. Look at that long nectar spur. Lots of bees and butterflies will visit these flowers, and with the cap that coloration, you'll even get a hummingbird or two. Now these are always a fun one, especially if you like tactile experiences because their seed pods swell with water as they mature and eventually get so swollen that they press and the slightest touch causes them to explode, rocketing their seeds out into the environment. I love these kinds of habitats, and anytime I get a chance to explore them, is a good time. Check it out, right up here I see some orchids, albeit not the ones we came looking for, but they're worth looking at nonetheless. This is the lily leaf twayblade, blade, Liparis liliifolia, complete with nice swollen seed stalk here. And right behind it we see the fall shift. This is a ladies tress, I believe it's the lesser ladies tress orchid, Spiranthes ovalis, although these can be kind of a taxonomic struggle. It's a wonderful little plant, not very big as you can see, complete with a single leaf, maybe two leaves here buried under the leaf litter and it blooms around this time of year. It's one you want to take a hand lens to because these flowers are small. They don't open very far, and even when they are in full bloom, again, all the details in miniature. Now this species used to be predominantly southern, although records indicate that it's actually increasing its range farther north. Some people have suggested that that's because it can handle a lot of disturbance. As you can see, it's growing on the side of a trail here, so that certainly holds true, but it could just be that it's mycorrhizal fungi, the partner that allows it to live, is also increasing its way north in response to something that's changing. And like all lady stresses, its flowers are arranged at the tip of the spike in a world appearance. Now this is probably in response to the way little bees forage. They start at the bottom and work their way in a circular path up the flower. And in a lot of different lady stress orchids, the female flowers are at the bottom and the male flowers are at the top. In that way, any pollen that they've brought in from another plant is deposited before they pick up their own pollen. And in that way, they're able to avoid self-fertilization. 
What a great find, and hopefully this means we're on track for finding the orchid we came here to see today. Well, they're probably not going to be here this year. It might be just too dry for them to emerge this year. Orchids, especially North America's terrestrial species, are the experts at the Disappearing Act, and the autumn coral root is no exception to that rule. Some research has shown in other species that their emergence are completely tied to the health and well-being of their mycorrhizal symbionts, or in this case, hosts, each year. So if the mycorrhizal fungi aren't doing that well, neither will the orchid. It's just a plain fact of life. And it makes these orchids extremely hard to get an accurate gauge on their population sizes, which is why we just don't know their status a lot of times here in North America. Well, I'm not saying I'm gonna count this year out completely, so maybe next time, in another video, we'll be seeing them again. Either way, thanks for watching. We saw some cool stuff, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Thanks, everyone.